Greetings and salutations, basketball fans. I am Akil Augustine. As always, The Hangout is a platform for Canadians to get their voice out about the topics of culture and basketball. That's why we're here. So today, it's not the circumstances that we want to have this conversation under, but you know what? There's no better time than now while we seize your attention to bring in some of our favorite Canadians to talk about a subject that needs to be talked about right now. But before we do that, I will do my very first land acknowledgement on our program. Long overdue, so let's begin. By the way of land acknowledgement, we come together geographically dispersed, but brought together virtually. Let us take a moment to reflect on the meaning of traditional territory, land, and places. The land I am on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. And now it's time, ladies and gentlemen, for us to meet our guests. Our first guest, you may recognize him or may not, because you can't see his ponytail or his spin moves or him dropping dimes on your Instagram feed like you're used to. But I'd like to introduce you to Michael Linklater, a former pro player who represented Team Canada in three on three and is now an analyst calling three on three for the Olympics as it is now an Olympic sport. So big up to Mike for being in the house. Thank you so much for your time. We also have Paige Crozon, who is currently an assistant coach for the Saskatchewan Rattlers, a two-time member of Saskatchewan's provincial team, and continues to support Saskatchewan on the national level as she is competing as a member of Canada's three-on-three women's national team. And Tanya Talaga. She is currently a staff columnist with the Globe and Mail, but she was a journalist for the Toronto Star for over 20 years, covering things like health, education, local issues, and investigations, and she is an award-winning author. So to the three of you, I would just like to say, welcome to the couch. We usually do this show on a couch, but you know, we're all dispersed across where we need to be, but I'm, I'm so thankful for you guys to taking this time. I know for your community, it's, um, I can only imagine as a black man, I know I've, I've felt over the last year, this is a very sensitive time for members of the various communities I mentioned during the land acknowledgement. So I'll start with this. There's been a sad number of bodies discovered recently um, across our country um, through the residential school system that's been, you know, rightfully under attack for its existence. As members of the community, what, what do you have to say? What would you like to say? What is the starting point for you? Uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Where, where do you guys want to go with this conversation? Because really, this is just a platform for you guys to speak on what I would feel is very close to your hearts. Well, honestly, I think even before getting started and posing this to me, I would like to pass it over to to one of our, our, our ladies here. Um, in my belief in our culture, it is really important that we acknowledge our, our, our women as they're the backbones of our, our communities, our families and our nation. So if, if one of them would like to go first, I would prefer uh, to defer that. Buju anin Tanya Talaga Nagisnikas Ka Musko Pimojija Pinishish Nagisnikas. I'm really grateful to be here talking to you today. I, I'm in Toronto. Um, my my mom and her family and all of her her mothers and mothers are um, from the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation, which is northwest of Lake Superior. And I'm really grateful for Michael um, and Akil and Paige and for this conversation and for you asking me to, uh, to say something, um, especially considering the discovery of the children, the 215 in Tecumloops to Shwepna. Um, I actually just returned from Tecumloops to Shwepna. I was invited by the community to come and to bear witness to what was happening what is happening with the discovery of the kids and to tell the story of the community. It's a heavy time right now. It's an emotional time for, for all of us. All of us, every single First Nation, Métis, Inuit person has been touched by the Indian residential school experience. You know, there was over 140, at least 140 schools from coast to coast to coast and more than 150,000 of our children were taken and put in those schools. And as we all know, 
the numbers of our lost kids are in the thousands. A really conservative estimate is 3,200, but we're actually thinking the number is at least five times greater, 15,000, 20,000 kids that just never made it home. So this is a time of reflection and a time of um, a time of healing and a time where we kind of hold our families close and we listen to our elders and we listen to our family members that were in the schools because we've all heard stories of the kids that didn't come home. And I have to say that I'm thinking a lot about my family at this time. I'm thinking a lot about everybody's families this time. And I'm thinking a lot about those kids, those kids that are still out there waiting to be found and waiting to be brought home. So hi everyone, my name is Paige Crozen. I am joining you from Tree 6, homeland of the Métis people. Um, I would like to just first acknowledge uh, that I am a settler to Canada. So this is a very interesting uh, conversation to have. I'm also the manager of the Living Skies Indigenous Basketball League, Saskatchewan's first ever provincial wide Indigenous Basketball League. And as a settler, and coming into an Indigenous nonprofit organization um, and being an ally to the Indigenous community, I feel like it's, it's my responsibility. And the work that I've had to do coming into this organization is first challenge my beliefs, building genuine connections within my organization and beyond. Uh, we've been very fortunate to run camps in three communities so far throughout the province and, and working with the youth and you can see the impact. Um, but it's my responsibility uh, to help uplift and amplify the voices of Indigenous people and uh, learning and educating myself, learning about the calls to action. There's uh, four calls to action that relate to sports specifically, as well as the calls to justice and truth and reconciliation. So um, continuing as a non-Indigenous person to educate my, myself and then using my platform to amplify Indigenous voices within my community and within my league. Anua Guma Agantik, the Tumska Tinawao, the Hoi Mua Sinua Pimtawa. Michael Linkler Nisigasun, I go got to go na Ostinia, Absis Nehewin. Mojas got Nehewan Maga Ketea, Exenamochek in a hill on Kapik Square when we start Agamema. Um, it's really good to be here with all of you. I really appreciate the time uh, to have this discussion. Uh, my name is Michael Linklater. Uh, my given name is White Wolf. And, you know, this conversation that we're having is, is, is really important. I'm coming to you from Treaty 6 territory. Uh, I'm a Cree from Thunderchild First Nation. And it's, it's important that I'm taking that initiative to learn, learn the language. And that's what I was sharing with you is that I don't know the language fully yet, but I'm doing my best to, to learn and, and understand it from, from our elders. And so I'm, I'm continuing on that path. And even just speaking about language for a moment here, with my personal upbringing, I was raised by residential school survivors, as, as many of my generation uh, have been. And one of the things in my own experience is that because of the traumas that they suffered, I, I recognize that, you know, my family, they didn't speak the language to anybody that didn't understand it because of the trauma that they suffered. So a generation has somewhat um, been, been um, I don't want to say lost, but there's been a little bit of a void of that communication. And I used to say that, well, my parents didn't teach me how to speak. Um, you know, it's it's not their their fault or their responsibility. So me as a as a grown human being now, it's my responsibility to learn the language. And so those were some of the acknowledgements that I shared um, initially in in Neheo and the Cree language. Um, you know, given the the recent findings and it coming to light, a, a sad reality to that for the First Nations communities is that. It's sad, first and foremost, that, you know, those lives were lost and the many others. But what's even more sad is that it's not a surprise to us. We, I grew up hearing the stories. I grew up hearing the firsthand accounts of the traumas and experiences that my parents suffered. And 
the effects that we still feel to this day and how that generational trauma has been passed down. But it is on us to continue to work through that as not only as Indigenous people, but as you know, people on Turtle Island. It's really important to take this time to understand um, you know, these stories. And when we take into account, really, this is, this is big news, but if you could just take a moment right now and you know, imagine that right now, if we started going through all of the school systems right now that are currently in Canada, and we started going through the playgrounds and finding bodies, how big of news would this be? You know, so that speaks volumes to even where we're at right now, that this is big news, but it's it's still not really getting the, the attention or the support that it that mm -hmm. it needs. So first and foremost, we have to acknowledge, you know, those those children that didn't make it home. Second is the families of those children who are wondering where their children went. And then having that understanding that a lot of these families are still suffering from those losses. And when we see people who are struggling, who are of Indigenous descent, it's not because they're lazy or it's not because they're addicts. It's understanding that trauma that they've gone through. And if we can put ourselves in those shoes of, of, of those families, how would we feel if our kids didn't come home from school today? And the school mm -hmm. systems tell us we don't know where they are or we don't know what happened to them or give us no information. What would that do to us? You know, so it's really important that we, we take a moment to put ourselves in other people's shoes to really recognize, you know, some of the, the hardships that are going through. I guess, you know, hard conversation to navigate. So I want to be sensitive to everything everyone's feeling. I feel like there's a momentum and energy we've built so far. So I'm going to ask Tanya, um, could you please tell me, like, in your respective space, what was the first encounter where you were critically aware of your identity as, you know, a native person to this land and there was that separation or was that something you're always aware of and, and, and how does that play out now? Mm. Uh, miigwech for, um, for asking that question. You know, I never, um, um, I was actually born in Scarborough and um, when we were six years old, my, uh, my family, um, my mom is Anishinaabe and my father is Polish Canadian. Um, and my family moved to, uh, to Markham, so just to north of Toronto. And at the time, you know, I always felt totally out of place. I never felt like I belonged when I was a kid. You know, I didn't really have too, too many friends. Um, you know, when people would uh, ask, also ask me, you know, where are you from? Because I, I looked different at the time than a lot of the, um, the, the folks that I grew up with. I mean, when I was growing up in the 70s and the, um, the 80s, Markham was a pretty white Anglo-Saxon place. Um, and so I was the only Polish native Canadian. My brother and I used to laugh about us being, you know, a, a club of two um, in our community where we grew up because we were so separate. And I always felt apart. Um, and I never knew why my mother cried at night. Um, you know, I never knew why um, our family. Like my mom was raised by residential school survivors and um, I knew when I was little about residential schools, I thought that everybody had grandparents that went to the schools. I thought that was normal. And then I remember going through the school system and nobody talked about us. You know, I remember there was like a couple paragraphs once we got into high school about the fur trade. And that was one of the very first times that I ever encountered, you know, the fact is that there were indigenous people in this land. Like I knew that we were here, but it was like, nobody wanted to talk about us. Nobody, um, nobody wanted to acknowledge us. And the, um, you know, um, the racism that, um, that comes out when you tell people, when people ask you, well, where are you from? And, I, and I'll tell them, I said, well, my mom is Ojibwe and my dad is Polish. And they would look at me like I have six heads and just totally not understand who I am at all. And it was hard growing up as a kid like that, you know, it, it was. And we would spend summers um, where my mother grew up. Uh, my mother grew up literally in the bush um, outside of Thunder Bay. And um, it was there that I felt 
also out of place. Because, you know, I'm growing up as a kid in the suburb, then you get up there and I'm fishing all the time. I'm snaring rabbits. I'm doing things that I, I never did in, in my suburb house. And I was like trying to figure out who I am. You know, it's like you, you don't feel like you're comfortable in any space. And this is a very long answer to your question, but, you know, it's it's identity is rolling, right? I mean, like who you are is rolling and getting to a place of pride and understanding with an indigenous family with, if you belong to a native family, you got a lot of stuff going on. There's, you know, um, kids in your family that um, were part of the scoop. You know, you've got family members that were part of the residential school system. Um, some families have addictions, abuse, all of these things. And you're constantly coming to reckoning with all of the parts that make you up, but also to a great amount of pride and resilience in who you are and the fact that your family is still there and that you are still here, that I am still here, even though we've had a country, Canada, that had policies to erase us, to get rid of us, to move us aside, you know. So when you ask about identity, all of these things come into my mind. And what comes to my heart is the fact that we are so resilient and the love that we have, that we're still here and we're holding it together. And we are really now pushing forward and taking back the space we're reclaiming. Absolutely, a very important answer. Michael, for you, you found the game of basketball. When did you, to bring it full circle as we're here with NBA TV and the Toronto Raptors, when, like, was it, first off, what gravitated you towards the game of basketball? Was it that it was, you know, were there minorities that you could identify with? Did your native identity ever come into conflict with the world of basketball? I, I found the game of basketball right outside my school. I went to an inner city community school in Saskatoon, and a lot of the demographic in the neighborhood was, was indigenous. And we had a court that was just built, freshly built, so we came out one recess, and there was a lot of kids playing, and it's something that I had never played before. But just seeing the environment that was there, the excitement, basically like going to uh, an NBA finals game. <laughs> that was my first experience at seeing the game of basketball, you know, firsthand. But mind you, this was a bunch of kids in the neighborhood. And uh, from that moment, I decided to, to pick up the game uh, and, and play. Um, with regards to my identity, I, you know, have been very, very fortunate and blessed. Um, my biological mother was a part of the 60s scoop and my biological grandmother uh, was a residential school survivor. It was my grandmother's sister who raised me because my mother struggled with addictions and her late husband and those are the two who I call mom and dad. Part of their experience and trauma through residential school was the, the, the genocide of their cultural identity. And so they recognized that they needed to get back to their ceremonies, their spirituality and their inherent way of life. And when I came into their life, I was 10 days old and they had already established a, 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 a connection to who they were, to their roots. And my late father was uh, Ojibwe from uh, Kuchiching, which is outside Fort Francis. So when I first came back to Canada, I actually lived in Thunder Bay, Ontario, because my mother was mm. actually adopted off to the States. So I was actually born in New Jersey because of the 60s scoop. And yes, the government will mm. have a hand in it that were, you know, getting children up for adoption. So that's where my mother ended up. And my aunt is the one that found me. So when I was back in, in their arms, they had already established that understanding with, with our traditional way of life and our spirituality. And so I have been very fortunate and blessed to, to grow up surrounded and embraced by my culture and my spirituality. So that was my first identity. I was attending ceremonies before I could walk or talk or even remember. So it's, it's a way of life that I've grown up with. And given the amount of um, success that I've, I've had throughout my life, I, all, I attribute it all to my spirituality and my culture, as well as my parents for their resiliency. 
So it is, is, is really important and we see a huge um, uh, outcry from our people who have lost that sense of identity or connection and it's refinding um, their identity. And, 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 and some of us, like we, we've had, you know, friends of mine, we've had a bit of, of, of shame that, you know, we've lost that connection, but it's just important that we continue to support one another on that journey of healing. Now as an exemplar of an example of an ally, and, um, talk to me about, you know, the circumstances around um, your decision to get into the, to giving back to the native community. Yeah, so first, um, just recognizing the privileges that I've had and, and being able to play sports in a system that was designed for me, um, I felt it was very important to pay it forward and, and give back and create, um, help create for underrepresented populations. So I'm now part of the Living Skies Indigenous Basketball League, like I mentioned, and part of our initiatives and what we want to do is to create a basketball league one, but weave in the indigenous culture. So um, in the spirit of reconciliation, we're welcoming all youth and all youth are learning indigenous customs. Uh, there's indigenous knowledge incorporated into our practice plans. And we had a camp recently where the facilitator talked about uh, identity, culture, the connection to culture and how important and powerful it was for all the youth, as well as removing barriers of entry. So we're making the league free for everyone. We're providing transportation, just trying to remove the barriers so everyone can come to play because I know how important sport was for me and the life lessons that it provided for myself. Um, so to be able to provide that for all you is very important to me. Mike, I'll start with you with this one. Like what, like, cause, cause like, I, I know you from my Instagram feed. I know you from like, I see in your hard drives and your defense. So um, you're in there, you're an influencer in the basketball community, not just in your native community. So what can the basketball community do? Uh, Paige, you can answer next. And that I, I, I'd love for Tanya to close this one. But um, what can the basketball community do? Because I feel like it's done so much for, for, for myself, for minorities, right? It's such a diverse sport. How can we move from being like a welcoming sport to being actually inclusive of our native brethren? I've had a number of discussions with um, some big organizations. I won't name any of them. But the most important thing when we're talking about inclusion is, is exactly that. In inclusion, including um, members of our community. When we look at some of these boards that are directing these organizations, what do we see around the table? The other component is um, how much of these, these organizations are aware of what we're talking about today. So not only having that inclusion or that representation on all levels throughout these organizations, it, but it's important to make sure that these organizations are doing their part to one part of TRC. First thing is truth, understanding the truth, the true history and, and understanding what happened in, in all levels of, of, of our people throughout our government and in our nation and how it's um, come to what it is today. But also too is, is making sure that you're, you're really putting or, or organizations are putting their best foot forward to really take an act towards true reconciliation in understanding uh, where we come from. And when you have people who, our communities have absolutely every different level of educated and experienced person. So to say that our communities are not qualified to sit in some of these positions is an outright lie and is part of the systemic and systematic racism that we still face today. So for these organizations in basketball, it's having an understanding. And for you to, to kick this off in a good way by acknowledging uh, the land that you're on really means a lot, mm -hmm. you know, as, as, a, mm -hmm. as a First Nations person, it, it means a lot. And that shows to me that you're doing your part to understand or do your part to understanding as, as best as you can. So for these organizations, mm -hmm. they really, they really need, really need that. Um, sensitivity, indigenous sensitivity training, um, 
having that understanding right from the board all the way down to the frontline staff. We didn't learn this in the schools, um, in, in, in our workforce now. I think it's important for every organization, even outside of sport, to make sure that they have that understanding. Well, I think Michael said it wonderfully. And just to build on his point and why it's important, why representation matters, we're going across Saskatchewan running camps. And I can't tell you the number of youth that come into the camp and we ask, who's your favorite athlete? And they say Michael Linklater. And acknowledging everything that he has overcome and the barriers he had over, had to overcome to get to that position and to be such an idol. And he, like 250 kids are in that gym because of him. They could be getting into a lot worse trouble, but there because of he was such a good representation and role model and it showed that they could get there because he he got there, he did it, he played professionally on the university team and at various other levels. So that's why it's why representation is so important. As the anti here, I would like to say that a good first step is this conversation. Every time I hear um, an organization, especially a big organization, taking a leap like this, and an, an organization that is um, that has a lot of power and a lot of influence over youth. So many of our youth watch the Raptors. You know, so many of our youth watch Michael. They know who he is. You know, they play the game, and they love it. They love as well the diversity within the game, and that makes. I think it, it makes us feel a little bit more welcome than other games too. And um, just to echo what Michael said, inclusion, 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 land acknowledgements, acknowledging the land of where you are standing on, because we are all connected. The Anishinaabe, our people believe that we are connected to the earth, to the sky, to the trees, to the animals, and every one of us has a purpose here. All of our lives matter. There is a continuum that we all must be a part of. And making sure kids see that. Kids see themselves represented in basketball organizations. You know, not just playing, but also to the sidelines, you know, um, also in the offices in the boardrooms, making decisions, as Michael said, that is so, so important. Because if not, then we're just feeding into tokenism. And that's that's not a good thing. You know, we, we actually want to hear and see ourselves reflected in organizations in a meaningful way. And sports really matters. It's a really great equalizer. I know in our communities in the North, sports is a huge deal. Hockey is a huge deal. Um, having an ice rink is a huge deal. Having a basketball is a huge deal and a spot to play. And if the Raptors can do that, can help bring sports to our kids, that teaches confidence in who they are. It makes them feel like they belong and it gives them something to strive for. And I think that this is an amazing step that you guys are doing and you just got to keep doing it. You know, do the land acknowledgements at the game. Um, bring in our music. Bring in the power of the drum. Listen to us and see us. It's going to bring power to all of us. Thank you, Auntie. And with that being said, today <laughs> is just a small drop in the bucket that we settlers need to fill on behalf of our native brethren. So I want to thank the legend. Michael Linklater, um, we got we to gotta get him out of here. He's got more places to go, more people to see. He's got to save the country. Um, uh, on behalf of the rest of the Settlers, Paige, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Shouts out to Saskatchewan Rattlers, and good luck to you and the rest of the ladies representing our great nation. And also, Tanya, thank you so much for not just your words, your 20 years of service to us as a journalist and for being my auntie. So thank you, all no, of you guys, anytime, so much. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> I'm Mickey Lagos This is a very wish. special edition of The Hangout. Peace.